Πρώτα-πρώτα ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την πρόσκληση. Και όταν ο κύριος Κατζούλης έλεγε για τα, τα, τα νιάτα μας, ας τα πούμε, ότι ο, ο κύριος Κατζούλης έχει γεννηθεί στην, στην Καβάλα και εγώ στη Θάσο. Δεν ξέρουμε καλά-καλά, αλλά μπορούμε και να είμαστε και συγκινείς. Με αυτό λίγο συγκινήθηκα λίγο, αλλά νομίζω στα γεράματα έτσι είμαστε, γιατί εμεί Έλληνε έτσι είμαστε. Και τώρα θα αρχίσω να μην τα σκοτώσω όλα, θα αρχίσω τώρα στα αγγλικά, που θα, νομίζω ότι η ομιλία μου θα είναι πιο καλύτερη. Εν πάση, περι, εν πάση περιπτώσει, I have been asked to give a talk on the surgical uh, options for the failing fontan. It was my great pleasure. Uh, and uh, of course, there are others who are, have been dear friends over the years, uh, namely uh, uh, Kyrgios Mitropoulos, uh, uh, Kyrgios Saris, και ο Δασκαλόπουλος, όλοι και όλοι που είμαστε εδώ μαζί στην Διάσπρα και στην Ελλάδα έχουμε κρατήσει την, την, το θέμα του ελληνισμού και θα τα πούμε αυτά λίγο περισσότερο έπειτα. So, what are the surgical options for the failing Fontaine? Uh, well, one can do Fontaine conversion, which Barbara Deal and I have sort of Uh, uh, put on the map. Uh, one can do cardiac transplantation, which we heard a little bit about uh, earlier today. And then what we haven't really talked about was the idea of uh, using the ventricular assist device. And what would that do? Uh, that would, um, just a little bit here. Uh, that would uh, transition the patient to cardiac transplantation based on not only um, stabilizing the circulation, but also uh, an interim treatment for protein, uh, for protein losing enteropathy and plastic bronchitis. Although that issue has not been totally uh, agreed upon. Uh, and then of course, it could be destination therapy. And uh, that of course is, hasn't been, uh, um, uh, uh, that the outcomes of that have not been um, totally um, studied yet. So what about the intermediate term outcome for the 140 consecutive Fontan conversions that we did at Children's Memorial Hospital in association with Dr. Deal and, and Dr. Backer? Uh, they were 140 Fontan conversions and 139 patients. The median age was 23. That's rather important because uh, when we get up to the 40 year olds and 50 year olds, this is probably not the best operation. The freedom from death or transplant was 90% at uh, five years, 84% at 10 years, and 66% at 15 years. By multivariate analysis, the risk factor for death or OCT, that's orthotopic cardiac transplantation, uh, were right or intermediate uh, ventricular morphology. Now that is becoming much more important because the, um, the, the, the uh, Norwood operation uh, almost universally uh, deals with patients who have a right ventricular morphology, and we will be seeing many more of those patients as time goes by. Uh, the freedom from recurrence from atrial tachycardia was 77% at 10 years. Going on with this same uh, review, the late uh, orthotopic cardiac transplantation occurred in eight patients in our group at a median time of 0.9 years postoperatively. So if the transplant was going to occur, it would occur relatively early. There were four deaths, that means 50% involving these patients. Among the 24, uh, 24 late deaths, that is to say 17.4%, there were three non-cardiac deaths due to a motor vehicle accident, medication overdose, and metastatic appendiceal carcinoma. The late cardiac deaths, four were in the first month after transplantation, four had sudden deaths, four from complications of, congenital heart, of uh, congestive heart failure, and one each from liver failure, liver cancer, intracranial hemorrhage, sepsis, voluntary discontinuing of renal dialysis, and four were unknown. The, um, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve showing the survival curve demonstrating a freedom from cardiac death or transplant in uh, these, these uh, Fontan patients. Notice here, as we met, noted on a previous slide, there's a steady, um, fall uh, or follow-up uh, steady uh, decrease in survivability over uh, 18 to 15 to 20 years. 
This is another uh, curve demonstrating the freedom from atrial arrhythmia recurrence, stratified by arrhythmia surgery category. Uh, and, um, and we have thought that uh, the recurrence rate was uh, rather uh, low, with the exception of those who, had, who underwent a, a um, biatrial maze. They tend to have uh, uh, a recurrence uh, a little bit higher than the other, the other uh, groups, which are uh, isthmus ablation, right atrial maze, and biatrial maze. So what we have concluded by this, um, this review was that Fontan conversion has favorable intermediate term transplant free survival and emphasis on intermediate term and freedom from arrhythmia recurrence when compared with alternative treatment options. Uh, the extension of transplant free survival beyond the fourth decade of life is possible with this approach. And then careful selection criteria may determine which patients should be considered for early cardiac transplantation. Now, when we did this operation, uh, we made a, a, a large effort to uh, visit other programs and, and uh, show people how, just how this is done. This is clearly not a, um, a, a simple operation. All, most of the time, it's a se second or third reach sternotomy. There's a considerable amount of bleeding. Uh, there is a lot to do, and, it, and the way we approach this operation was two, uh, two surgeons, me and Dr. Backer, and uh, that's why I think that we had uh, the relative re, uh, um, success that we had. Now look at this slide. Look at the number of, um, of, of programs that have actually duplicated our, our series, our, our results. And, uh, and we interpreted that as a, as a success story in itself, because not only were we able to do what we did, but we were able to show others how to do, how to do it, and they in fact did it. So they had 503 patients, including our 139 patients. The uh, numbers having arrhythmia surgery was 73%. The operative mortality is 5.8% for the, the whole group. Ours was 1.4%. Nevertheless, 5.8% in patients undergoing this kind of surgery, which by the way, included valve repair, uh, aneurysm repair, and the like, was only 5.8%. Well, uh, we were always asked the question, uh, well, look, if you have such good results with Fontan conversion in selected patients, maybe we should do a late Fontan uh, revision uh, without uh, symptoms. And so I never could say, and we never had the results or the data to show that one way or the other. Fortunately, uh, the Japanese group uh, uh, answered this question for us, and they had only 32 patients who had Fontan conversions, but importantly, seven had no symptoms. Uh, while the results were very similar, they came, they came to the conclusion that uh, prophylactic Fontan conversion is not justified. And I think that that's a very, this is a very good uh, uh, contribution to the literature, despite the fact that there are only a few patients involved here. Most uh, programs um, ha uh, would agree with this uh, conclusion. And that's probably why, um, it wasn't done in a, in a prospective manner. So what were the lessons that we learned over 20 years? Well, we learned that arrhythmia surgery is necessary to treat arrhythmias. If you do a hemodynamic repair and not treat the arrhythmias, the arrhythmias will not go away. Uh, we also learned that pacemaker therapy is important for atrioventricular conduction. And we learned that extra cardiac connections seem to be optimal and that's what we do uh, or have done as a, um, a policy. And we also found that concomitant operations can be performed despite longer cross clamp times uh, in order to get the hemodynamic uh, consequences and hemodynamic results as perfect as possible. Attention to the details of surgery will yield best results, careful initial dissection. Sometimes it, it, it could take two or two and a half hours just to do the dissection. Avoid hemodynamic instability. Uh, patients can, uh, do poorly if uh, they're not cared for during the time of uh, dissection. Conscientious placement of cryoablation lesions. Correct the associated lesions such as uh, valve uh, regurgitation and aneurysms. And meticulous hemot hemostasis at the end of the procedure. Bringing a patient back to the intensive care unit for after a Fontan conversion who is bleeding is not the best way to go about this. That patient should be without blood, at, without any bleeding whatsoever, 
And uh, that's, that's uh, challenging enough for the post-operative uh, period. It's required, judicious preoperative assessment is absolutely required. Know the limita limitations and contraindications of Fontan conversion and consider cardiac transplantation when necessary. Uh, I'm going to show you some of the um, uh, operations that we did and that we uh, uh, determined were necessary in order to perform a uh, Fontan conversion. This is the cannulation technique. You see that the uh, dotted line there is the area of how much uh, atrium can be resected in order to avoid uh, the consequences of recurrent atrial uh, tachycardia. Uh, now, it, oftentimes, uh, we don't see this much anymore, but in the older days, um, uh, people thought that even if it's a small uh, right ventricle, that a, uh, that a Bjork modification could be performed. That is to say, a conduit from the right atrium to the right ventricle, even as small as it might be. Uh, the trouble with this is uh, that it doesn't always work and that uh, the right atrium can, can get enlarged. And uh, this has to be taken down for a, um, a extra cardiac fontan. Occasionally, one would see a, um, a valve placed here. The valve really never worked because there was never pulsatile flow. And then this uh, valve would, uh, would uh, be sclerotic in the open position and cause uh, stenosis as well. Uh, the key to this operation is not only to remove the conduit, uh, but also to dissect the area between the atri uh, atrium and uh, uh, the atrioventricular groove here. Care must be taken not to, uh, not to uh, enter the right coronary artery, which you can see there in the middle of the drawing. And then uh, uh, one has to put a patch on that right ventricle because if you um, disconnect the main pulmonary artery, that right ventricle will undergo um, dilatation and actually uh, impair the left ventricular function. So what, that, what one does here is put a patch on the right ventricle, allow the Fabesian blood flow to go out the pulmonary artery. And then one does the extracardiac fontan, as you can see here, that Fabesian flow into the pulmonary artery is, uh, is negligent, uh, I mean, not negligent, but negligible, and uh, it should, does not affect the uh, outcome of the extracardiac fontan. Uh, sometimes we, ha we have patients with discontinuous pulmonary arteries. In the early stages, we used a, a homograph to connect the left and right pulmonary artery. Uh, however, we found that uh, homographs can cause uh, pre uh, antibodies, uh, preformed antibodies, which would negatively affect a future cardiac transplantation. So owing to that, we went up with, uh, we, we use uh, Gore-Tex to connect the uh, main pulmonary arteries and of course the extracardiac portion of the Fontan. Now, these uh, cryoablation lesions are not insignificant. Uh, the idea is to, um, is to make the area of slow conduction which, con which causes atrial reentry tachycardia, make that area into an area of no conduction. So the area between that, tri that uh, tricuspid annulus there and the inferior vena cava is a classic area for, um, for, um, atrial, uh, for atrial conduction to go into that area and then slow down. And when it slows down, then the other part of the atrium picks it up and then you have a, a circuit movement and you have atrial tachycardia. The idea is to, uh, is to um, stop the, uh, the area of, of, of uh, slow conduction so that there'll be no more atrial tachycardia. Uh, in the, the early days of the Mayo Clinic, and they really uh, uh, performed um, complex Fontan procedures uh, before anyone else did. Uh, they, they did it on in double inlet ventricle, double inlet right ventricle. And this is a uh, area here where they put a patch on the tricuspid valve. Now this patient had atrial reentry tachycardia, but you couldn't put a cryoablation from here to there because it's covered by a patch. So what we had to do is remove the patch. And then uh, this is what the result is. And then apply the, the uh, lesions, the cryoablation lesions appropriately. And then this area and this area of slow conduction now has no conduction. And then we treat the atrial reentry tachycardia successfully. And then putting a new patch on it is a relatively a simple matter. And, uh, and then that's the way most of the right atrial mazes are performed. Occasionally, we have a patient who had a Kawashima repair, namely the left, uh, left inferior vena cava came up 
and, uh, and it was connected to the left pulmonary artery. Uh, that was the, uh, the extent of the operation. Uh, however, that caused a decrease of uh, hepatic factor uh, to the left lung, resulting in um, uh, AV malformations uh, in the left side, which of course can cause cyanosis. Uh, the, way, the way to deal with that is to connect the left superior vena cava uh, inferior vena cava to the uh, hepatic veins in order for the uh, for, uh, uh, hepatic factor to get to both the right and the left lungs. This actually can be done without cardiopulmonary bypass. This is a left thoracotomy showing a Gore-Tex patch between the inferior vena cava on your right-hand side and the hepatic veins on the left-hand side. And uh, this patient over a period of two to three weeks uh, went from an oxygen saturation in the 70s to the to in the mid 90s. Well, uh, many of these patients required uh, AV valve repairs. These are some of the uh, uh, characteristics of the valve repairs that we did. Uh, on the left is cleft closure. That I, every time I saw that, I was quite happy because it's a relatively simple matter to close that uh, zone of apposition. And then uh, we also did Carpentier annuloplasties and, and Alfieri stitches and suture annuloplasty, whichever uh, uh, seemed to be the best um, solution to the problem of the AV valve regurgitation. Uh, the, the arrhythmia management is uh, relatively straightforward if you, uh, if you just uh, take into consideration what needs to be done. Uh, it's um, electrophysiologic study can be done not only preoperatively, but intraoperatively as well. I had the great pleasure of working with uh, Barbara Deal, who uh, I don't know what her IQ is, but it's off the off the scale, uh, and, and she let me and she let me know it every time we work together. Uh, God bless her; she's doing extremely well now, and I I, I talk with her often. Uh, we did a right a modified right atrial maze procedure for atrial range tachycardia, uh, a maze three procedure for atrial fibrillation, pacemaker implantation in every patient, and postoperative EP study. And we use beta blockade or amiodarone for three months postoperatively. And you've seen this before. This is a cartoon drawing of how one does a modified right atrial maze procedure. And then we had the challenges of how do you do a right atrial maze procedure when, when one has tricuspid atresia? And, uh, and we use the coronary sinus as our uh, goal here. We did not go near the uh, conduction system because that would result in um, in heart block. So this is what we do for tricuspid atresia. What about mitral atresia? Well, uh, it's very similar to what we did for tricuspid atresia, but we connected the lesion from the inferior vena cava to the, um, to the tricuspid annulus, as you can see in this drawing. Uh, for AV canal, uh, it, it, this is what we did. Uh, it's a little bit more um, challenging because we don't really have very much data on this, but whatever we did seemed to work pretty well. Uh, the Cox Maze uh, four uh, the Cox Maze procedure uh, for atrial atrial fibrillation is noted here. Notice that uh, one has to perform either with surgery or with cryoablation a lesion around the um, confluence of the pulmonary veins connected to the left atrial appendage, which is to be excised, and also to the coronary sinus. This is what it looks like uh, when one does it. Uh, halfway with surgery and halfway with cryoablation. Notice there on the left-hand side there, there's a uh, left atrial appendage is, uh, is, is uh, removed and then sutured uh, uh, primarily. Uh, the, I, I present this not so much to show the extracardiac fontan, which all of you know, but also that we always used uh, uh, our, uh, uh, leads, pacemaker leads. And when we left the operating room, the, we would always pace the right atrium, not so much the right ventricle or the ventricle, we would pace the right atrium. Uh, and that would be the way uh, the patient would leave the hospital with atrially paced uh, uh, and, uh, uh, system that would of course go through the AV node onto the ventricles. So Fontan conversion with arrhythmia surgery results in excellent outcomes. Increasing incidence of atrial fibrillation and left atrial tachycardia parallels the increase in complexity of patients, which we have reported. Evolution of uh, pacemaker technology has provided more options for postoperative EP management. And as importantly, or perhaps more importantly, Fontan conversion does not preclude cardiac 
transplantation, which will continue to be an important mode of therapy for these patients. What is the future for patients with a failing Fontan? Well, we talked about Fontan conversion. It's not good for protein losing enteropathy, classic bronchitis, ventricular dysfunction, or advanced age. And by this, I mean after 35 to 40 years of age. Cardiac transplantation will remain uh, an important part of the therapy here. It does have a higher mortality because uh, many patients die waiting for a heart to become available. And there's also a higher mortality for transplant surgery owing to the associated lesions thereto pertaining. And now we, of course, we have the, uh, the ability to use ventricular cyst devices uh, when used appropriately. So what, what about the uh, ventricular cyst devices? For the failing Fontan population is a growing cohort of ventricular cyst uh, patients. Idea is to apply VAD technology to address ventricular dysfunction, to improve hemodynamic stability and, and end organ dysfunction. So one would hope that liver dysfunction would improve, protein losing enteropathy uh, would abate, classic bronchitis would go away, and renal dysfunction would also improve. Now that hasn't been completely uh, uh, shown in these small numbers of uh, uh, patients that have undergone this therapy. The experience with VADS has been documented in small series. The reports show that a supplemonic support to help the problems of systemic venous congestion, long Losing interest is losing interest due to ventricular dysfunction. So in order for that to work, one has to have good ventricular function, but in many of these patients, that's not the case. So what is being used now, it's a ventricular, a systemic ventricular support, and that's the highest incidence of using this VAD. And also there are one or two cases of a total artificial heart, but uh, this is still not widely used. This is a picture showing a graph from the left ventricle to the aorta, namely that this is a ventricular assist device and that would improve left ventricular end diastolic pressure, improving the flow from the Fontan circuit to the left atrium and therefore to the, uh, to the systemic ventricle. Now here's a, a chest X-ray showing a VAD implant for the failing Fontan patient, which is implanted in the right atrium. Now, the only way that this could work is if they're an extra cardiac Fontan, because this is, uh, is, a, is, imp is using flow from the right atrium to the, uh, the ventricle. Uh, and, um, and that's not uh, helping the ventricular function as much as it is helping the, um, the venous pressure to decrease during this time. Well, there have been some recent STS, uh, a recent STS retrospective multi-institutional study that was performed from 2012 to 2019. Only 55 patients had a VAD uh, for failing Fontan circulation. The majority, 89%, had a VAD, had a VAD system, ventricular assist device to support the systemic ventricle. And there were a variety of continuous flow versus pulsatile flow. Most of uh, people who've studied this issue uh, think that the pulse, pulsatile flow is better. The biventricular uh, VAD was used in only 4%, and the total artificial heart, 1%, and the other 6% were of unknown type, mainly because this is a a, 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 a database study and one does not always have all the information that one wants. So the results were based on, surg on the surgical era. Uh, this, that's month, not moth. Six month survival en route to transplant or recovery was 86.4%, which is pretty good. Patients on pre-VAD ECMO fared worse. So in other words, if you had a pa patient who wasn't doing very well, you put them on ECMO, ECMO and then uh, put them into put, uh, and then trans and trans uh, for the and transferred them, shall we say, to uh, a VAD. They didn't do very worse, and their mortality was higher. Five patients were supported. Supported. Imagine this: five patients were supported for greater than a year using this, and one patient was supported 4.6 years. Now, this is just a few patients here, but that to me, this is remarkable. End organ improvement and dev uh, uh, and device complications were uh, were noted. The trend is toward improvement in renal and hepatic function, although that did not show uh, a statistical significance. There were, however, adverse effects, as you might imagine, with these kinds of uh, VADs. Devi there was device thrombosis requiring change, four episodes of stroke. That's a, that happens a lot. Uh, that happens in all kinds of uh, uh, ventricular cyst device. 
and three episodes of hemorrhage, of course, due to the anticoagulation. The GI rate bleed was 7%, and the total adverse rates were 13.1% at 100 patient months. All in all, not bad for the kinds of patients that, that, that we're treating. So patients with failing Fontan will require support with advancing age, no question about that. Fontan conversion will, with arrhythmia surgery can be used in selected patients with the idea that future cardiac transplantation is likely. The best treatment outcome if donor organs are available is cardiac transplantation despite lifelong anti-rejection medication. Failing Fontan patients with ventricular dysfunction and end organ dysfunction will require ventricular device en route to end organ improvement and eventual cardiac transplantation, we hope. Uh, I hope that I don't emote uh, as I move forward here, because it's quite possible. Uh, we're at war. There's no blinking the eye that we are at war. Uh, NATO is preserving and trying to preserve democracy in a country that is being uh, undergoing uh, attempted um, destruction. And uh, I think that it, there's a possibility that this can escalate, which would include all of us in many, many ways. I see patients, I see no, I don't see patients. I see mothers and their children fleeing Ukraine. And I'm, I'm reminded of this picture. And those of you who can see the background, can note that this is uh, taken at the White Tower. And uh, it was taken in 1947, shortly after four years of brutal occupation in World War II. My mother is on the left-hand side there as you look, pretty woman to be sure, no teeth, malnutrition, still feeding the little baby she's holding in her arms, and that was I, that, that's me. And my brother was uh, putting his, his hands on his uh, knees there. We're ready to go on a bus, 1947, to, from Thessaloniki to Athens to get on, a, on a, a ship called the Saturnia to come to the United States. Now, the, during this time, we said goodbye to everyone, and. During this time, there was a, the, the, the Greek Civil War was raging and we were, uh, uh, we were going to Athens and there was a, a battle going on um, and there was cannon fire. And I asked my brother, what was going on? He said, oh, I knew we were very close to the battle because I could feel the reverberations of the cannon fire in my chest. And I said, uh, and by the way, he had all the gold coins that we owned were in his shoes for fear of them being taken away if we were boarded on the bus. And I said to him, what was I doing at this time? He said, you were holding on to mama. I said, what were you doing? He said the same. Well, we were boarded on the bus. People were looking for money and uh, my brother uh, never gave up uh, the, uh, the coins. And fortunately we made it like these people who are making it out of Ukraine. Well, this is the end of today's uh, session. There is uh, no way that I couldn't have not have shown this picture. Um, it represents much of the diaspora. Of course, uh, Michael, I didn't include the United Kingdom flag and perhaps some of the others, but it does represent an enosis of, of commitment and love of freedom. And if I can, and I hope I can, I want to recite a poem. Well, you all know it as the ethnic Imna. I'm not going to sing it. It 
σε γνωρίζω από την κόψη του σπαθιού την τρομερή. Σε γνωρίζω από την όψη που με βιά μετρά στη γη. Απ' τα κόκαλα βγαλμένα των Ελλήνων τα ιερά έσαν πρώταν άντριωμένοι χέρε χέρε ελευθεριά. Thank you for indulging me this emotional outbreak. Sorry, I did that. I think it's because of my age. I think Michael understands that too, because he has the same kind of feelings as do, do every one of you who are on this uh, program. Uh, stay well, enjoy the rest of the day and evening. Uh, thank you again for your hospitality. Thank you, Kaz.